workshop is just one small part of a powerful, information-packed multimedia seminar. If you want to turn your garden into a weed-free, super-healthy, nutritional power plant, you'll need all the information in the book and audio tapes as well. And, as a multimedia seminar owner, you can join the team of Voice of Nature affiliates who are getting paid to share this powerful knowledge with others. Watch for the details at the end of this video. In the deepest recesses of the collective human consciousness lies the memory of a garden, the first home of mankind in his innocence, a paradise lost, the Garden of Eden. The ancient Middle Eastern prophet Ezekiel describes the creation of a beautiful angel in the heart of paradise itself. Speaking of this angel, he says, you came into being in Eden the Garden of God. It would appear that long before Eden became the home of the human race on this earth, it was the home of deity and of angels, the seat of the throne of the heavenly kingdom. Jesus the Nazarene taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. The great master gardener, Alan Chadwick, believed that the answer to the self-destructive tendencies of humanity manifested in wars, terrorism, and crime was to be found in a return to the peaceable occupation of gardening, the divine right of the race. The prophet Ezekiel penned the poetic prose of the divine mind, a promise to the fallen but greatly loved people of earth. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Through cooperation with the selfless ways of nature, Eden can be restored in whatever patch of earth you have to plant on. Chadwick's vision of peace in the midst of life's cruelest storms is one of the gifts that the garden is waiting to bless you with, along with better health through super nutrition without the combined curses of insect pests, plant disease, and weed infestation. Welcome to the New Bionomic Grower Basic Skills Video Workshop, part of the complete New Bionomic Grower Multimedia Seminar. I'm Ian Jones. This video is intended only as a supplement to visually illustrate how some of the more unique gardening skills are performed. You will need the accompanying manual because the video doesn't include all the details necessary to start your garden. The other details are just as important. So if you want your garden to be successful, don't skip over them. Read the manual. That really should be the first step you take in this gardening course. After you've mastered all the information and skills in both the manual and this video workshop, you'll be ready for the even more advanced information contained in the 10 audio lectures. The video has four sections. First, we'll discuss site selection and analyzing the soil. Next, we show you techniques for starting your own healthy seedlings. The heart of the video is the actual preparation of permanent raised beds using a one-time only double digging method. This section includes adding amendments to correct soil deficiencies identified in your soil analysis 
and how to transplant your seedlings correctly. Then we show you how to prepare a simple, inexpensive, but very effective food and stimulant for your soil microbes and plants. Well, enough of preliminaries. Let's get started. All the basic skills involved in bed preparation are universal and work in all soil conditions anywhere in the world. Today, we just happen to be in the beautiful mountains of eastern Washington. The first thing you need to consider as you get ready to do your garden outside is where you're going to put it. Some of you may not have any choice. You may have a very small area, but where you do have a choice, there are certain things you need to take into consideration, such as lighting, where the sun is, uh, how rich the soil is. There's quite a number of considerations. I won't go into detail on them now because you'll find a section in your manual where we help you to go through all of those considerations in picking a good spot for your garden. It is possible to grow a garden without sampling your soil. But if you want the super nutrition, the pest resistance and the disease resistance that is really possible with these methods that you're learning about, then you want to make the very small investment in time and money to go ahead and get your soil tested. In terms of time, it's only going to take a few minutes in a very small gardening area, and in terms of money investment, it will only cost you a tiny fraction of the value of food that you'll be able to grow even on one small bed. And you, when you realize that the food that's going to come out of that bed is going to be higher in quantity, higher in quality, higher in nutrition, it's going to have uh, fewer pest problems, fewer disease problems, uh, in some cases zero of these problems as you get your soil into perfect condition, then I mean it is well worth the price. Many gardeners spend a whole lot more money on the fixes, on the sprays, either chemical sprays or even organic, uh, natural so-called sprays and so on, but it's much better wisdom to put that money into the fertility of the soil because you're building for years to come. Okay, what you're going to do is you want to take a representative soil sample. Please refer back to your manual for the details on this entire process. The forms that you need to fill out are in your appendix. It will give you all the instructions that you need and the address to send your sample to to get the right kind of Albrecht-based uh, soil analysis and recommendations. What you want to do, there's two basic ways to take a simple sample in a, in a home setting, and that is, is to open up a hole. I've already opened up a hole here 12 inches deep with my spade, and in most soils, I would actually be able to come along with my spade and slice off a thin wedge of soil, pick it up, and use a screwdriver, a pocket knife to just slice off about a half inch of that and skim it off into my Ziploc bag. This is illustrated in the appendix in the back of your manual. In this case, the soil is too sandy and it falls apart. It doesn't have enough clay to hold together. And so I'm going to go to an alternate method, which will be to use a trowel. Now, whatever tools you use to take your soil, please be sure that you don't use rusty tools or tools that have been contaminated with some kind of chemical or something like that because it's amazing how even just a little bit of residue will be able to affect the analysis, especially when it comes to trace elements. For that same reason, you want to use a fresh, new, unused Ziploc bag to put your representative sample in to send it off to the lab. Don't use a used bread bag or some other plastic bag that has been used before because the residues of what was in there will throw your analysis off. And an inaccurate soil analysis is just as worthless as not sampling at all. 
In fact, it might be worse because it might actually tell you to do the wrong thing. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to use a good, clean, rust-free trowel, and I'm going to go down to the bottom of this hole, 12 inches down, and just scrape an even amount of soil all the way up from the top to the bottom. And you notice I've got the soil representative of that 12 inch strata and I'm going to put this into my bag. Now this one spot will not give me a representative sample nor is that enough soil for the lab to give you results. They have to test for a lot of different things. So what you want to do, even in a very small garden area, you still want to sample from at least three, four, five, six different places. The more different spots you sample from, the better. If you're sampling a half an acre, an acre or more, then this becomes even more critical. You want to sample from at least four or five spots per acre as long as the soil is even. Now, if the soil is visibly different or it's growing weeds or crops in a very visibly different way, uh, stay out of those areas that are, are different. You, you just want one type of soil in here. If, if, if that uh, area of soil that is different is just a tiny area, just don't worry about it. If it's a significant part of your garden, if it's half of your garden, then you might want to actually send in two separate samples. Okay, But as long as you are sampling in the same type of soil, you want to get a composite, put it together in your Ziploc bag, and then you're going to take a marker that is uh, indelible. You're going to put your date and you're going to put the identifying name of your sample onto it. All of the details and instructions, as I said, are in the appendix in the back of your manual. It will be well worth you taking the time to go through this process. While we're waiting for our soil analysis to come back from the lab, let's start our seedlings so that they'll be ready in about 30 days. We're going to use a very simply constructed wooden box that we call a flat. You can make it out of one by four dimension lumber on the side that's actually three and a half inches high. That will give you at least three inches depth of potting mix in your flat. It's best to use a rot resistant wood like cedar or redwood. This particular box is redwood, but it's not really essential. You can even use pine or something else, especially if you use a linseed oil and rub it down for the rot resistance. This particular flat uses wooden slats on the bottom. That is one option, although it adds a little bit more weight to the flat. As an alternative, you can use wire mesh or some people call it hardware cloth on the bottom instead and that makes the box a lot lighter. You're going to want to use an eighth inch optimally but even a quarter inch will work especially if you line the bottom with newspaper or dry leaves or something like that. Now your box can be any size in fact I absolutely recommend that you don't make yours quite as big as I've made mine because it's going to be kind of too heavy for a lot of people. Half this size one by one the smaller the better because it's going to be a lot lighter and easier to lift up when the potting mix is wet. You can buy your potting mix if you can find a good organic mix, but you want to avoid mixes that have manures because a lot of times the things that they're feeding the animals these days can be toxic and detrimental to the optimum growth of your plants. You can save money and absolutely know that you've got a pure mix by making your own. It's really very simple. A basic soil recipe would be one part sand to one part good garden soil and two parts peat moss. Optionally, you can also add a vegetable matter compost. If you're making your own compost at home, that's an excellent thing to put in if you have it. You don't have to use it if you don't have it, though. Rotted wood is another thing that you can consider putting in because it actually will help to prevent damping off disease. That's a fungal disease that we talk about more in your manual. Speaking of the garden soil, you're going to want to sterilize it in your oven. Spread it out on a cookie sheet like this and put it in the oven at 300 to 350 degrees and bake it thoroughly until done. No, just kidding. Bake it until it's thoroughly dried out and all the weed seeds are dead. 
Okay. Now, when you've got all of those basic ingredients put together, you're going to want to put some amendments, some nutrient goodies in. Some of the most important ones that you can look for would be a dolomite-type lime, which has both calcium and magnesium, which are very important for the growth of the plants, and also helps to neutralize the acid pH. Soft rock phosphate is also another very important ingredient that you're going to want to put in. If you can get a hold of a good broad-spectrum rock dust, like a volcanic rock dust or a granite rock dust, that's also an excellent product to put in. And finally, kelp meal is an excellent material to add for the trace elements and growth hormones that it contains. Again, check your manual for details on all of these things. After you finish mixing your soil ingredients, you want to fill your flat all the way up to the top and just rough level it off. Then you're going to come along with a tamper, which you can easily construct by cutting a piece of half-inch plywood so that it will fit on the inside of your flat and put a couple of handles on it, as we have here. And this will take the excess air out as you tamp it down. And it will also give you a nice, smooth planting surface. In this case, we've made a homemade tamper that even has wooden dowels spaced exactly on the two-inch centers that we want according to the manual. It's the hexagonal spacing that we explain in the manual. You want to refer back to that to fully understand that. We use that in the flats and outside in the beds too. Um, and this is very easy to make. But if you don't want to go through all that trouble, all you have to do is go down and buy a piece of chicken wire, one inch chicken wire. Again, cut it to the same size and shape as your flat, and then you will use that to space your seedlings by putting a seed in every other hole in the one inch chicken wire. This is really nice because it does the tamping operation and makes your holes all in one operation. Okay, now my flat has changed shape a little bit, but I'll get it. Okay, push it down and bring it up again carefully. Mm -hmm, hmm. There, beautiful. That worked just fine. Okay, now that I've got it tamped and I've got my holes in place, we're ready to drop our seeds in. In this case, we're going to plant dark green romaine lettuce. And one of the reasons that I chose lettuce for this demonstration is that I want you to realize that lettuce needs light to germinate. And so with lettuce, after we drop the seed in the hole, you're done. There's no covering it up. But I'll show you how to cover it up with other seeds just so that you see it's really very easy. My favorite way of putting the seeds in the holes is with a pair of tweezers. You want to put at least two or three seeds in every hole because you never have 100% germination rate on any seeds. And by putting two or three seeds, at least one is always going to germinate. And even if all three germinate, all you do is come along later on when they've all sprung up and have got to a good size and you just either pinch out or with a pair of scissors cut, carefully cut out the two smallest seedlings, and you save the strongest, largest, healthiest one. And this is a process of elimination that will help you to develop the strongest and best seedlings for your garden. Okay? So with your tweezers, you can easily pick up two or three at a time, drop them right in your hole. Some people don't prefer the tweezers, and there are different ways that you can do. I learned this method from one of my students. He uses a pencil. And uh, you can just take the eraser end, wet it with the tip of your tongue, and it will easily pick up several seeds, and you can drop them right in the hole. But later on, I discovered that you can do the same thing with the lead end, the pointed end, and that's a little bit more precise. Sometimes you pick up too many seeds with the eraser end, but with this end, you can easily pick up one or two seeds and of course now it's not going to work for me. There it is. There's two seeds on it. And we drop it right in there very, very easily. Okay. Well, for some people it's easy. I still like the tweezers better. Now you don't have to plant an entire flat 
with just one variety. If you don't need that much of whatever you're planting, you can plant it in different sections. Now I'll do some broccoli and show you how, with the case of other seeds besides lettuce, you would actually uh, pinch it shut afterwards. I'm going to drop a couple of seeds here. Put a second one in there. Come on down the line. Two or three seeds per hole. And now, after we've finished, we just take your two fingers and pinch it shut like that. Very simple. A general rule is to cover your seed with a depth of soil equal to two times the width of your seed. If you've used chicken wire to do the spacing of your seeds, they're just going to be lying on top of your potting mix like this. And then you want to take an extra handful of potting soil and just eat carefully broadcast it right on top until you evenly cover that seed up. Smooth it over and tamp it down a little bit and you'll be done. Okay, after you've got everything planted, it's very important for you then to mark your flats with whatever the variety and type of vegetable and the time that you plant it. We've done that here. We've marked right here on this plastic, white plastic marker with a black permanent marker, dark green romaine. And, uh, of course, if you don't know that romaine is lettuce, probably you want to write lettuce on there, too. Most people know that romaine is lettuce. And we put the date of our planting there, and then we can stick that right in there. The technique that you use in watering your newly sown seeds in your flats is very important because you don't want to wash those seeds away. You want to use either a watering wand or a watering can, doesn't matter which, but the most important thing is that the rose, which is the head that is on either your wand or your can, where the little holes are, where the water comes out, this is called your rose. You want to make sure that you have a rose where the holes are very small that gives you a good, fine spray. Besides that, you don't want to direct the spray straight down like that, because if you do, the water is coming out too forcefully, and you're still in danger of floating some of that soil and seeds away. The seeds will probably still sprout and come up, but they won't be spaced correctly, and that can be a problem. So what you do is you direct your rows upward like this, and then you adjust your spray until you get a good gentle spray and now you see it's going up and falling gently like a gentle rain and you're going to just move that back and forth across your flat until you get a good even watering but not so much that the water begins to pool and puddle too much and if your soil has been adequately moist before you even sowed your seed, then that's about all that you need, just a very light watering. And you want to check your seedlings daily to make sure that that soil surface doesn't dry out. It needs to stay moist because if it dries out, even for a couple of hours in the top half an inch where that seed is germinating, that seed is going to be dead, and you're going to lose your seedlings. So you want to check your flats morning and evening and apply water as necessary. In the summer, you're going to want to make sure that you keep your flats in a shady spot, either under a tree or under a little shade house that you've constructed. In the winter, you want to keep them in a cold frame or a greenhouse. In this case, we have a little greenhouse back here, and uh, we're going to take them off and put them back there because this is fall time and we want to protect it against the cold. Once our seedlings have grown up and they're ready to transplant in about 30 days from now, it's important that you go through a hardening off process before you transplant them directly out into your garden bed. What that hardening off means is that if 
you're in the cool part of the year, you're going to pull those flats out, those seedlings out for brief periods of time during the day to get them used to the cooler temperatures outside of your cold frame or your greenhouse and then put them in, put them back in. You do this uh, for several days or about a week ahead of your transplant time and you lengthen the time that you leave it exposed to the cold every day until the seedlings are used to. That way they won't go through a shock or, or actually die. In the warmer part of the year, the process is exactly the same except that you're taking the seedlings out of the cooler shady area into more direct sun or partial sun in a warmer spot and getting them hardened off and used to the warmer temperatures of the direct sun. Okay, after we have done our site selection and our soil analysis, the next thing that we want to do is lay out our beds. You're going to want your beds to be on average about four feet in width. They can be any length, but the width is very important because you want to establish the mini climate that is explained in your manual. And also you don't want the bed so wide that you cannot stand in the permanent pathway and reach all the way to the center of the bed without falling in or stepping on the bed because once these beds are dug we're never going to walk on them again so there isn't the compaction that you have as in regular gardens this allows the crops to grow and produce much much better and you don't have to do the digging and tilling year and year year in and year out in this case I have actually used a metal stake for a pilot hole I'm not going to use that permanently we made a pilot hole in this case because this soil is a little bit on the rocky side. If you don't have rocks in your soil, you don't have to worry about it. One of my favorite materials for stakes is Schedule 40 PVC because it is rot resistant, cheap, and will last practically forever. But you can use other materials, and we go into that in the manual. Because we're using the PVC and it's rocky, um, that's why we used the metal pilot. And now, this will go in all the way to the halfway point very easily. Our stake is two, two feet long and one foot will be below ground and approximately one foot above ground. We've just put the last string on the sides of our bed. You'll notice that we only put strings along the long sides of the bed. We don't need them across the short side because it's very easy to sight a straight line across there. Plus, when we're walking in and out, uh, you'll tend to trip over these strings if you have them all the way around. But this allows you to walk in and out without a lot of tripping. The most critically important thing for you to consider after your site selection, before you start your digging or anything else, is the moisture of the soil. Water is going to make the process of digging go absolutely easily. I don't care how heavy your soil is, if it's pure clay or anything. If you get the right moisture content so that it feels evenly moist but it's not too wet, it'll be easy to work. The important thing also is that it needs to be that moist all the way down 24 inches deep. So you may want to dig a, yourself a pilot hole and make sure that you've got the moisture all the way down and uh, check it. If your soil is dry, you're going to want to put a sprinkler out there and water it. Sometimes I've had to water for several days and put plastic on in between to keep the sun from evaporating it out. But make sure that you've got enough moisture. After you've got enough moisture, the next thing is you don't want it too wet. So you may have to cover up that bed area and let the excess water settle out until, as I said, it's evenly moist but not so wet that you actually can almost squeeze water out of it like a sponge. Having the right tool for any job makes the job go much more easily. And in this case, for these digging skills that we're going to demonstrate to you, the very best tools for the job are 
English made tools. There are several different brands. There are sources in the back of your manual in the appendix. This happens to be a tool made by Clarington Forge, very high quality tool. Uh, a longer metal shank here that helps to prevent breakage. Um, you'll also notice that this is a spade with a flat blade and flat bottom as opposed to a shovel which is actually a different tool. This shovel not only has a pointed bottom, some shovels have flat bottoms, but all shovels are curved. The blade is curved and you'll see later on when we get into the skill that a shovel will not work very well. It's very difficult to use a shovel. So you want a spade and then the other important tool is a digging fork. Again, you don't want a pitchfork. You'll notice that these tines are very thick and strong for digging. Tool care is very, very important. When you have good quality tools like these with a lifetime warranty on them, you want to take good care of them. When you have used them and they have soil on them, you don't want to wash them in water because even the slightest residue of water will help to rust to set in and it's like a cancer and it's very difficult or impossible to get rid of. What you want to do is just scrape the excess mud off with some kind of a stick or any flat hard surface and then get an oily rag. You can use just regular uh, cooking oil or mineral oil or lightweight machine oil and rub that tool down very thoroughly. It will finish cleaning it and it will leave a light coating of oil that protects your investment in good quality tools, keeps rust out. The other thing that I just want to mention quickly is tool safety. Whether it's your um, fork, your spade, or a rake, any tool that has sharp points on it, if you're going to lay it on the ground, make sure that you lay with the the sharp tines down, never pointed up. Same thing with your fork and your spade. Either leave them lying down like this with the sharp ends down or else stick them in the ground. That avoids injuries and difficulties. Another thing is if you're going to carry them, carry them down low. Never sling them over your shoulder like this. You never know when you're going to turn. There's someone behind you and you take out an eye or something else like that. These may seem to be small points, but they can be very, very important points. The first skill that we're going to demonstrate is called skimming. And we're going to show you how to get rid of any weed cover, grass sod, or even small brush very, very quickly. And in the process, you'll actually get rid of most of your weed seeds too. Before you start though, it's very important, especially on a new tool with your spade, to get a good sharp edge on the tool. That is going to make not only the skimming go very easily, but when we get into the digging, the blade will cut through the soil much more easily and there will be a lot less effort on your part. We're going to show you how, in all of these skills, how to let the tools do the work so that for you, it's very, very easy. And remember, every step that we're going to do here in this entire process is a one-time thing. It's an investment like building your house. And then later on, you're going to have a garden that needs less time and less labor than the average garden actually needs. Okay? Now, the way you do the skimming is, is if you're right-handed, you're going to grab what is called the cob of the handle. This right here is called the cob, and this is a D handle. You grab the cob with your right hand, palm down, and then you grab the shaft of the tool with your left hand, again, palm down. And if you're left-handed, you just reverse everything. I'm right-handed, so I'm going to grab the tool this way and hold my blade parallel to the ground. Then there's a couple of different positions that you can take up. You can either bend your knees, squat a little bit so that you can come down low to the ground, or else you can actually get down and work on one or two knees. This is an especially comfortable position if you have any kind of back problems at all, like, like I have. So I'm going to work in this position right now. I'll probably work in both. But now what you're going to do is you're going to actually thrust this spade straight ahead. You'll notice how my 
elbows bend rather than just swinging it with your arms straight because if you just swing it this way the tool is going to curve and you're going to take great big gouges of soil out and uh, you're going to just make a great big mess. The idea is that we're going to just skim the top quarter to half inch of soil and weeds and brush and grass off and remove them and get rid of them very quickly. This is the way it goes. You're going to thrust it forward like this and then turn it off to the side. Thrust it, turn it off. Thrust it, turn it off. And it makes a lot more sense to throw your skimmings out to the outside away from your bed. You notice that I'm skimming in the path area first. If I turn it onto the bed, then before I can skim that area, I'm going to have to go and rake all of that off. So you don't want to make double work for yourself. So we're going to go ahead and just very quickly skim this entire path area all the way around the bed. As you can see, we skimmed the paths all the way around the bed now and we've turned it all off to the side. Then you can come along with a rake and just rake that up into little piles all the way around that you can later on pick up with your fork, put in the wheelbarrow and carry off to a compost site. This will break down and make good material for potting soil mix later on or you can even bring it back to your beds later on. Okay, in just a minute I'm going to get my spade and we'll finish skimming the bed area. The easiest way to skim the bed area is to draw an imaginary line down the middle of the bed lengthways and hit this one half at a time. In other words, we're going to skim this half and throw this half all off to this side and then when we're through we're going to go around to the other end side of the bed and skim back this way and turn it all off that way. You see, because it's much easier for me being right-handed to turn off to my left rather than to try to throw it off that way. It's kind of awkward, okay? So do things the easy way, okay? And of course, as I said, if you're left-handed, everything is reversed, okay? So I'm going to do this side and come right down, turning it off into the pathway areas from which we will rake it up afterwards. And you see that this just goes very, very fast. Okay, we have finished skimming the entire pathway and bed area. And we've raked everything up now on the side with our rake. And now we can load it up to our wheelbarrow and get it out of our way. And you'll find that when you have a big pile of skimmings like this with grass and weeds and soil, your digging fork will be the easiest thing to be able to grab huge bites at one time. It'll go into the pile more easily than the spade will. But as you get closer to the bottom, especially if your soil is rather sandy like it is here, you'll see how it's starting to fall through the tines. And so don't be afraid to switch to a more appropriate tool. Now we can just scoop up the, rem the remnants with the spade. And while I'm doing this, I'm noticing that my wheelbarrow is getting a little on the full side. And you'll find that soil is heavy. So don't overfill your wheelbarrow. If you have a really big wheelbarrow, don't fill it at all. <laughs> Why make things harder on yourself? Just uh, figure out how much you can wheel away without working too hard. And then this whole process becomes not only good, health-giving, uh, gentle, repetitive motion exercise, which the doctors say is the very best kind of exercise you can get, but you'll be having fun along the way. You won't even have to break a sweat or work up your heart rate too much. Now that we've skimmed both our bed area and the pathways around the bed, the next important skill is called edging. We're going to use our spade and we're going to cut an edge all the way around the perimeter of this bed. 
and you'll see that this is very, very important because as we start to do the actual groundbreaking skills in the next steps, we don't want the pathway area to get broken up. And so by cutting this edge all the way around, it keeps the breakup of the ground on the inside of the bed where it belongs and it keeps the pathways from being broken up. Already, this is another skill which is easy to see that a curved shovel just would not work very well. You need the flat blade to cut a good straight edge. Same thing with the skimming before, by the way. A shovel just would not do the job very well. Now, you'll notice as I go that I will be holding my spade at an angle, uh, probably about a, a, a 15 or 20 degree angle from straight up and down. It's a natural angle that keeps the uh, handle of the tool going at about the same angle as my foot. And so it feels very natural, very comfortable. The tool just becomes a logical extension of my body, and I let the tool do the work. Again, instead of putting forth a lot of energy and trying to hammer down on this tool with my foot and start getting a sore instep and exerting a lot of energy, all I do is just lean my body weight onto the tool and rock it back and forth and it just works its way, it works its way in. Now in rocky soil, you'll sometimes come to a rock and you can't get any further. Here I've hit a rock. Don't worry about it. Just go as deep as you can. I'm going to move over now and again, we're just going to lean body weight onto the tool and rock from side to side and this time I can get all the way in. Again, leaning my body weight onto the tool, rocking from side to side, and I'm not even breaking a sweat. My heart is not going any faster. This is actually really fun. I never forget in one particular seminar where we demonstrated these techniques, uh, everybody kind of uh, pretended that the spade was their partner and this was like a little natural dance out in in nature and it doesn't hurt anything no immorality in this just nothing but pure fun and you can really get a rhythm going and uh, if you want some soft music in the background wouldn't hurt either in fact if you turn to your manual on the chapter in gratitude You'll see how beneficial the right kind of music can be for your plants later on. And if you want to play some music while you're having fun out here doing these techniques, oh, I'm sure it'll be even more fun. Notice the angle of the spade, and that's very important. Later on, I'll show you why that angle is important. You do not want to have your blade going straight up and down like this. And I said, if I explain now, you won't actually be able to see it, but I promise I will explain that to you when we get to the actual digging. Now that we've edged all the way around our beds, we've switched tools, we're going to use our fork now, and this is a very fun skill and a very important skill. Every step that we do all the way through this process makes the following steps go much more easily. And this pre-loosening of the top 12 inches makes the rest of the dig go like a piece of cake. What we're going to do again, we're going to let the tool do the work. I just want to emphasize that no matter how it looks to you sitting there just watching this, this isn't really work. This is fun. And the tools are doing the work for you. And I mean, I'm just having a blast out here. I wish that you could be in here doing it with me. And in fact, I encourage you, as soon as you learn, get your tools and get out there and do it. And you'll find out that it really is 
a load of fun. Okay, what I'm going to do is instead of just, again, ramming down on this fork and sinking it all in with my might and wasting a lot of energy and then rearing back on the tool, I'm not going to do all that. That's hard on you and it's hard on the tools. And so what I'm going to do is I don't start all the way up against my string because uh, the ground is always going to break up a couple of inches to the outside of the most outside tine here. So I come in a couple of inches, set my tool down, and just push it in an inch or two. Then I'm going to use the leverage of the tool, bringing the handle all the way down and breaking up the soil. Now here I'm going to go in just a little bit more. That was almost too much. This soil is really easy to work here. And now I'm going to bring it all the way down. And already it's breaking up all the way to the outside. So at this point on this first row, I'm not going to go all the way in. That's as far as I'm going to go. Because if I sink it any deeper and pull back, I'm going to be breaking up my path area, which is something I absolutely don't want to do. Okay, now I come over. And again, I repeat the process. In about an inch, bring it all the way down. In a little more, bring it down. In a little more, bring it down. And when it breaks up all the way to the outside, that's where I'm through. There's something else I want you to notice. A lot of people, when they're first starting this skill, they'll put their tines in and they'll pull the handle right back straight towards themselves and they can't get very much breakup. And they say, well, I can't do it. Well, all you have to do is stand with your body slightly to one side, okay? Now, everyone is either right-handed or left-handed, usually, unless you're ambidextrous, and usually you'll find out that with working with these tools with your feet, you'll find that either your left foot or your right foot is more comfortable. In my case, I'm left-footed, and so my left foot I find more comfortable, and I can work with my right hand standing slightly to one side and bring the handle down. Now, if you feel more comfortable with your right foot, and if you're left-handed especially, you might work the other way. Try both ways. See what works best for you. Okay? So I want to go in a little bit, pull it all the way down. And you see that by standing to one side, I can bring the, the handle almost all the way to the ground and get a lot of leverage, a lot of breakup. It's that leverage that's doing the work for you. Now that we've done the full width of the bed, and that first row coming across where we couldn't get the tines all the way in, I'm going to come back not more than about six inches. Again, you don't want to take great big huge bites because it's going to be harder work on you and harder work on the tool. So I only come back about six inches and in a little, down, in a little, down, in, down. This time you see I can go all the way in. In, down, in, down, in, down. In, down, in, down, all the way in, and pull it back. In, down, in, down, in, down. The skill goes very, very rapidly. I'm almost halfway through already. One thing you want to be aware of is that if you're working in a rocky soil, pay attention to when you hit rocks. Uh, if they're very small, you can just uh, break it up, break, break up the rock, loosen up the rock right with it very easily. But here at this point, you hear that? I've actually hit a larger rock, and um, I'm not going to try to force that or anything. Um, in the rest of the digging process, we'll get that out. It won't be any problem, okay? So I'm just going to leave that and continue working. I hit it again there. Once you master this skill, you should try doing it slowly at first, but once you master this skill, you can begin to work very quickly and very rapidly. You see how fast I'm able to go. As you can see, we finished loosening the top 12 inches of our entire bed. Did you notice how easy that was? The tool does all the work, essentially, when you use these techniques correctly. 
notice that we didn't have to do what some people do when they use a fork. We didn't have to get the load of soil, pick it all the way up, and turn it over, and all of that kind of thing. That's just not necessary. This is just simply a pre-loosening process, and it gets us ready for the next step where we're going to actually dig the soil with the spade, and you'll see. We'll do that one step at a time. I just want you to notice how easy it is and what we don't have to do. Okay? Now that we've pre-loosened, we don't want to go walk over it again and compact it right back. So we're going to use a digging board, which is nothing more than a piece of uh, half-inch plywood cut to the width of our bed, which is uh, four feet by two feet that we will step on and it evenly distributes our weight so it doesn't recompact the soil. Now I'm going to position my wheelbarrow here in place and we are going to now remove one foot of soil from the trench, one foot deep. And the blade of your spade is roughly about one foot. So we use that as a measuring tool. And we measure from the end of the bed back 12 inches on either side. And that's where you place your board. The front edge of this board now becomes a guide for us in cutting. We're going to actually open up a trench. And this first step is the only point at which we're actually going to take soil out and remove it. After this, it gets much easier. So now we're going to just take all of this soil out. It goes very, very easily because of that pre-loosening process. It's just a process of shoveling it out from the bed into the wheelbarrow. And I'm going to continue here until I've got all this soil out. And as soon as this trench is completely open up, there's a few finer points that I want to point out to you. Okay, actually, at this point, our wheelbarrow has enough soil in it that I don't want to make it any fuller than that and get too heavy. So what we do with this is we are going to wheel this all the way around the other side of the bed and dump it in a pile there. And you will see when we get to the other end of the bed why we put it there. I won't tell you now. Some of you may figure it out. Now, when I dump it here, I don't want to dump it right up too close to the bed. I'm going to leave myself uh, two or three feet of space and I'm going to dump it back here. in a pile. Okay, I want to position the wheelbarrow back up here and I'm going to finish digging the last of this soil out. Now, the finer point that I mentioned is, you remember when we were edging all the way around the bed that we were cutting that slight angle out into the pathway. At this point, it's important as we're digging our soil out to go ahead and dig that soil out at that angle. And in just a minute, I want you to come up real close and you can get a closer look at that. But I want to mention one other thing, that when you're digging here in the corners and edging it out, don't dig all the way up to your stake, because if you do, it's going to collapse. The string's going to pull it and it's going to collapse. So at this point, I'm just going to come up to within a couple of inches of the stake and leave some soil there to keep that stake, stake anchored. And I will just cut my edge all along the end of the bed and all the way around. Now, I'll get this out of the way like this. Now that we've finished excavating our first trench, you can better see the edge 
that we've cut and excavated out here. We do it all the way around on all three sides here on this first trench. Also, you want to notice here that in the corners where the stakes are, I have not cut that out or edged that out. I've left soil all the way around there so that that stake will stay nice and firmly anchored and won't fall down in. The other thing that I want you to notice is that I've used my spade, which is 12 inches roughly, uh, as a depth gauge so that when the tread of my spade lines up with the surface of the soil, I know that I've dug my trench deep enough and uh, it's time to quit. Now you can see why we removed the soil from the top 12 inches and opened this trench. It's just for one reason. It's so that I can do what I'm about to do right now, and that is we've gotten right down into the trench, and we're going to use our fork again and do exactly the same thing that we did in the top 12 inches. We're going to now loosen the bottom 12 inches of soil. I'm going to start right up here in the corner and again it's going to be very similar as when we started edging, not edging, but when we started loosening in this first row earlier. I'm not going to be able to get all the way in because if I did I would, the tines would hit up against the hard soil uh, of the pathway. So I just go in as far as I can and I'm actually starting to hit a few rocks. One of the nice things about this whole process is is that it's a one-time thing and in the process any rocks that are in the soil you just get a chance to uh, pull them out through the digging process. And here are a few here that we got out as a result of opening up the first, the first trench. Now, where I have hit right onto a rock, I'm going to come back an inch or so and see if I can't get my tines under and around it and very easily pry that rock out, okay? I've gotten under it, and uh, let's see if we can, sometimes you can get them pretty easily, and uh, okay, it's starting to come now. You want to... You want to work it very gently. These are strong tools, but you don't want to force it. You see I've actually pulled out a granite rock here that's breaking up. And once those rocks are out, they're out for good. And we've got them out 24 inches deep. And even if you're in a part of the country where you have frost heave and rocks are working themselves up from down deep, and you, it seems like your soil is growing rocks, it's not really, they're actually coming up from down deep. It will take years and years and years for any rocks to come from three feet deep into your growing zone again. Okay, I'm working up some more rocks here. And now that these rocks are out, the soil is loose, 24 inches deep, and in place of rocks, you've got soil. So you can, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that where you've got soil, where you used to have rocks, now your plants can set down roots there and they're going to grow a whole lot better because they have bigger, stronger root, root systems that are going a lot deeper than before. Right now I'm just, I'm just uh, loosening up rocks here, pulling them out. Okay, now I'm gonna come back just a couple of inches and in a little, bring it down. In a little more, bring it down. In a little more, and I'm gonna to have to work it in between these rocks. In, down, in, and down, in and down. And now I'm going to pull the rocks up to where I can just pull them all the way out. And I'm gonna do this all the way across, but I want to draw your attention to one thing. Okay, I'm gonna be able to come back and maybe do one more spot here, in, down, and I'm hitting a rock, so I'm going to have to find the edge of that rock. If you ever get to the point where you hit really large rocks, sometimes, occasionally, you'll have to switch to the spade, which is a little bit stronger, and in some cases, I've even dug beds where we wound up with some boulders like that, and then we switch to a digging bar, but uh, that's going to be pretty rare. 
that uh, you have to you have to do that. Most times, just with these simple techniques, you can pull out even large rocks like this. This wasn't this wasn't any much work at all. Um, it's 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 just the leverage action of the tool, and uh, not forcing the tool, but just getting the tool underneath the rock and using the leverage just to pry it out. And once it's out, it's out. Okay, now you'll notice I can't go back any further because I'm clear up against the edge here. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn around and I'm going to work back from the other side exactly the same way. And uh, it will force me to have to actually step on what I've loosened up already, but that's just fine because once I'm finished, I'm going to step out of the trench and just come back and quickly re-loosen that part that I stepped on again and we'll be through. I'll join you again when I finish this trench and I'll show you what the next step is. Now that we finished loosening the bottom 12 inches with our fork in the first trench, we're going to pull our digging board back another 12 inches. Again, I'm going to use the spade to measure the distance. Check it here on the other side, but you can also basically see if your board is square with the string. Now, the next skill is just absolutely simple. We're not going to have to actually dig any more soil out the way we did to make the first trench. All we're going to do is work in this pre-loosened soil and take little slices. When I say little slices, I'm talking about only about a couple of inches of soil at a time. Just slice it right off here with our spade and just scoot it forward into the first trench. Essentially what we're doing is we're opening up a second trench and taking the soil from there and filling it into the hole of the first trench. But we're doing it just a couple of inches at a time in this easy pre-loosened, nice moist soil and it just goes so easy it's almost no effort at all. I don't have to pick it way up or do anything. All I do is just kind of scoot it forward, let it slide right off the spade. Slice, scoot it forward, and let it slide off. And I'm done here. Now I'm just going to move over one foot and start the process again. Slice it off, slide it off, slice it off, and slide it off. I mean, it's not only easy, but this is really fun. I mean, it really is. I love this. I enjoy it. And of course, you might say, well, your soil is a little bit sandy here. Yes, it's true. If you have a, a heavier clay, um, you might have a few more clods. But since you did the pre-loosening process, it's actually just as easy. It's just that if you have a sandier soil like this, um, there's, there's no clods at all. It's, it's uh, later on, and you won't have as much work to do breaking, breaking clods. But um, the whole process is very, very simple. Slice a couple of inches and just let it slide right off. Now some people will want to make believe that they're a typewriter <laughs> and instead of going, working their way all the way back and then moving their way over one foot, they'll, they'll just take a slice off here and then take a slice off here and they'll go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's too much work. Do it the easy way. Just work all the way back to the digging board, then move over, take your slice off, let it slide off. Now you'll notice that in order to get all of the soil out of the way of this second trench, you'll actually have to throw some of the soil a little bit outside of the bed into the path area. That's just fine. Okay, now at this point, to finish cleaning out my trench, I'm going to get down on one or two knees so that I can get down low and just finish shoveling this out. But again, I'm not going very far. I'm not having to throw this way out or into a wheelbarrow. I'm just scooping up this loose soil and just 
emptying it out just one foot away, right here like this. Very, very easy. Another thing that it's uh, useful to learn how to do is how to switch hands. Okay, it's a little bit awkward at first, but uh, once you learn, it's not no problem. Switch hands, and then you can work this way into this corner of the bed and scoop the soil out of there. Remember to cut your edges out, okay? On both sides, cut your edge, okay? Scoop the last of that soil out, like that. Don't worry that it's falling out. If you turn up any rocks, pick them up, throw them out, and then you're ready to get your fork, get down in the bottom, and loosen it again. And now we're just going to continue this simple process, one trench at a time, all the way back until we've reached the last trench. When we reach the last trench, I'll show you what we do next. Where we're on the very last trench, and I just want you to notice this good pile of rocks that we had. We had a really good time here pulling these rocks out, and you'd just be amazed at how easily uh, they come out. And uh, as you come across, you notice how uh, the bed, the soil in the bed has been raising up. This is not because we've added any soil at all to this bed. This is simply because the digging process has added so much air down so deep that the soil actually raises up and we've created a raised bed. Now, after we have gotten here to the very last trench that we're just about to start, we no longer need the digging board. We can take it away and put it aside entirely because now we've got the firm pathway to stand on. And now you can also see why I emphasize that you don't want to dump your pile of soil right up against the end of the bed because if you do that, then you're not going to have any place to stand. You're going to have to be stepping on top of your, your soil, which isn't going to be a good idea. So this is exactly the same process as before. And we won't go through it again because you saw it already. But I just want to mention just a couple of things before I start on this that, you know, this whole process really is so enjoyable. It just so happens that recently I haven't been getting enough exercise, I confess. I've been having to sit behind a desk at a computer and all the rest of it. And right now, after having dug through this bed with just this easy, gentle, uh, repetitive motion exercise, uh, there's someone that actually calls this lazy bed gardening because the process of digging, you know, there's really not a whole lot of effort involved in it. And uh, then after you're finished, it's even more of a lazy process because you don't have to dig again. You just kind of come and put your plants in and all the rest of it. But through this easy, slow, gentle, repetitive motion exercise, my muscles feel so good and warm and, and limber and I'm just feeling really good. You know, there are some people that pay lots of money to go to gyms and spas and get some of the health benefits that you get. And it's not just exercise. As you come in contact with the soil, especially as I had to get down here and get my hands in the soil to pull the rocks out and everything, the soil has uh, gentle electrical currents that are very, very healing and beneficial to the body. Besides that, the clay in the soil helps to pull toxins out of the body. It's very healthy and very healing. Again, there are wealthy people that pay lots of money to go and get clay mud baths uh, to do the same thing, to get beautiful skin and clean bodies. But out here in the garden, you get everything along with the fresh air. There's a nice breeze blowing right now. The sun is shining. It's just such a beautiful, wonderful, therapeutic thing. I really don't want you to look at this as work. It's really just benefit after benefit after benefit. Why? Because it's the very occupation that God gave to us in the very, very beginning in the Garden of Eden. As soon as I finish this trench here, I'll show you what we do next uh, with this pile of soil. You probably figured it out already, though.
As I'm finishing up this last trench, I just want to re-emphasize a couple of very, very important points in your technique here. We're down here getting ready to loosen this with the fork, and you're going to start just a few inches out from the edge, but at first you're only going to be able to go in a couple of inches, loosen, and that's all you're going to be able to do. If, if I go try to go in any, any deeper and pull back, I can't do it because I'm hitting the hard compacted ground, okay? So please don't force these, these tools. Be smart about it because even though they're strong, uh, you can, if you really force it, you can break a tine. And of course, if you do use cheaper tools, then it's even easy, easier to, uh, to break them. I'll, I'll just mention too that when you use cheaper tools, the work is actually harder. I couldn't understand that until the first time I got one of these tools in my hand. It's absolutely phenomenal. I talk about how easy this whole process goes. One of the reasons is because the tools are so good. The handles are longer than, than normal. You get the better leverage. Uh, they just have a feel in your hand that is just phenomenal. So I really, really encourage you that if you're going to be serious about your gardening, you're going to follow through these methods. Get these good tools last a lifetime and you, you'll use them even after you finish your beds. You'll find all kinds of other uses for them in the future. Okay, so after you have done that first couple of inches right up close, then you come back a few more inches and it's in a little, down, in a little bit more, and down, and then you can put it all the way in and down, and this time I can bring it all the way in and down without hitting the edge. That's a very important point. Okay, now I've actually had finished loosening this before. As I step out, I'm going to just re-loosen this part that I had stepped on like this. Okay, and one last thing that I want to point out before we fill this trench in for good. And that is, you remember, when you get to your end, you're not only going to be cutting your edge on this side and on that side, on the long side of your bed, but don't forget to cut your edge out on the end of the bed as well. And when we get further down in this process and get ready to put our transplants in, I'll explain to you just why that edge was so important. Maybe you can figure it out on your own. Okay, we're ready now to fill this trench back in. Now it becomes very obvious why this pile is here. If you hadn't figured it out already, it's because we ended up with this big open trench here at the end of this bed, and now we're gonna use this soil that originally came from a first trench on the other end of the bed to fill it in. I'm going to go ahead and fill this all in, and then I'll explain to you the next step. Okay. You notice that as we finish up getting the last of the soil from that pile, you can't get it all with the spade, so you switch tools. These are the three main tools that you need in this whole gardening system, especially digging is basically just the fork, the spade, and the rake. And the only other tool that we'll actually use today, behind, besides the fact that we use the hammer to put our stakes in, will be a trowel to do our transplanting in a little while. Okay, you'll notice that uh, there's a few problems that we're going to fix now. Uh, first of all, very commonly it happens that uh, you wind up with not enough soil here on the end where you finished, and you always wind up with a situation where you had to throw your soil uh, too far outside. When you have a lot of soil to move, you want to use your spade. Uh, so what we're going to do is just come along and get this soil and throw it down here to the other end where it's too low. All the way across here. If your bed was really, really long, then you might want to shovel this into a wheelbarrow and wheel it down. But in this case, 
since our bed is only seven feet long, it's not a problem just to throw it down. And of course, this is just the first step. We're not finished yet. We're gonna get most of it inside the bed. Now we still got way too much soil on this end and not enough there. So we're gonna use our spade to knock down soil from those high areas and bring it over into the low areas. Oh, I just uh, remembered something else I need to tell you. I felt the ground move under me a little bit just now. And that's because, you remember how we edged out all the way around? Because of that, there's no, not much support underneath you if you if you step too close to the edge. So when you have an open trench, you never want to go and walk and stand right on the edge of the trench. If you do, you're going to collapse your pathway and uh, you're gonna be on your seat down in the hole. And even after you first dug here, because this soil is still so loose, if you, in the process of doing your final soil moving and shaping and raking and everything, if you come right up on the edge and stand, you're still in danger of creating a little sinkhole here. So for the first few days after you've dug a fresh bed, just be aware to stay out a few inches away from the edge as you're walking around it, okay? That's, uh, that's, an, that's an important point. Okay, now I'm gonna come over here and get this high spot, bring it down to the end, still low in there. Let's see, where else? That's pretty good now. That's pretty good as far as a rough distribution. Now we're going to switch to our rake to do the final shaping. And I really, really enjoy this part, but this is actually a skill that takes probably uh, the most practice because it's basically all in the eye, eye-hand coordination. Now some people, when they build raised beds, they like to go out and buy lumber or some other material and build up the sides and, and then smooth the top off flat. And if that's what you prefer, then by all means go ahead and do that. There is so much room for individuality and in gardening. What we share with you are basic universal principles that work everywhere and will give you the very, very best results. But then you can change the details to suit your personal preferences. One of the reasons I like the mounded shape that we're going to make is because it's cheaper. You don't have any other material to purchase. And not only that, but we're, instead of winding up with a flat surface, we're going to wind up with a curved surface that gives us actually more planting area within the same bed. So when you're planting crops that uh, are spaced closely together, you can actually get a slightly higher yield. The goal here is you start on one side and uh, you're going to leave your strings on because you still need those guidelines to, to be able to see where you're the edge of your bed is on these long sides. On the end, it's no problem. You can eyeball that quite easily. And you're gonna start here now with your, the tines of your rake just inside the string. And you're gonna pull up and across, changing and modulating the pressure as you go so that you're uh, knocking down the high spots, filling in the low spots, and starting to get this rough curve shape across your bed. Okay, we're going to come all the way across from one side like this. And when we've done that, now I'm going to come around the other side. I'm going to do exactly the same thing from this side. I'm going to start at the edge of the bed, pull the soil all the way up and across. All the way up and across, modulating my pressure so that I start to get this curved shape, being careful not to step too close to the edge of the bed to cause a collapse. When you have a, a more sandy soil like this, you have to be even more careful because it collapses much more easily than a, than a clay soil works. Okay, you can already begin to see 
the rough curvature of the bed. Now that we've done that, we're going to come and start to get our angle on the ends of the bed, like so. Come in from this side and get the angle here on a bed. Now we're going to rake along the long, the length of the bed this way. Again, the goal is to knock down the high spots and fill in the low spots, working on developing this beautiful round mound of soil that I personally believe looks very, very beautiful even when it's just finished, just raw soil. Once you get your crops growing on it and, it, and it's that just solid canopy of leaves and color, it's even more gorgeous. Okay, I come around to this other side now and continue to rake. And you notice I'm going back and forth, both pushing the soil and, uh, and pulling it. I've got a clump of roots here that I don't really want. Also, I'm seeing a few rocks that I will carefully rake off the bed and out into the path area. Now this happens to be a sandy soil as I've mentioned a couple of times before and so it already is, has, a, has a very nice uh, what they call tilth. Okay, it's just nice and loose and, and crumbly like that. But if you did have uh, a clay soil, which is most of the places I've been, I've, I've dealt with the clay and uh, if you refer back to your manual, you'll find out that that clay is not a curse. It's actually a blessing. And you can turn that into just a wonderful, wonderful uh, loose soil that's going to be able to hold more nutrients than a sandy soil can. Uh, but if you have a clay and you've got large and small clods here now over your bed, there's a couple of things that you can do to fix that. One of them is, is that you can rake them off down into the pathway and then with your boots you just uh, dance a little jig on them, stomp them, uh, crush them, and then you can rake them back onto the bed. The other thing that you can do is use your fork and you do something that's called tilthing. Okay, tilth is a word that has to do with the structure of the soil. When soil has good tilth, it means it has a nice loose crumb structure. Okay, like nice leavened bread or raised bread. Okay, for tilthing, you'll just hold your fork like this and you'll strike it sideways across the bed, just hitting the clods like this. And as you hit them sideways like this, they will just break and crumble. Okay, you don't want to hit directly straight down on the bed because you're going to be compacting the soil again too much. So it's just a sideways glancing blow like this to break up your clods. Either that or raking down into the path and stomping on them with your boots. Okay, well I'm just going to fix this part that I messed up here again. And uh, pretty much we, we have our basic shape, bed shape in place now. And uh, I'm just going to touch up a few spots that I see here, pull any soil that's still outside the bed into the bed area, get my nice, uh, and you know, one of the points is, is that this, this uh, shallow slope that you develop on, on the sides is shallow enough so that when you're watering or when it rains, uh, there won't be strong erosion, you know, won't wash. If the, if the soil was almost straight up and down, then of course you'd have soil erosion. But here, because of the shallow slope and also because the soil is loose and full of air, open pore structure now, uh, this bed can just soak up uh, inches of rain. And as a result, you can run these beds even straight down a significant slope and uh, the beds won't erode. They won't wash away. Uh, unless you had, uh, you know, a, a really bad hurricane that comes through that's going to take your house and everything else away. But uh, under any normal circumstances, uh, it's not going to erode or cause any problems. Okay, that's it as far as our shaping. I just want you to come in from the end so that you can just kind of get an idea of what this shape 
looks like uh, from, from the end of the bed. As you're looking in from the end of the bed now, you can see the gentle curvature of the bed. And because this is a sandier soil, the raising up or the loft of the bed is rather modest. But in the case of a clay soil, it actually raises up a lot more because more air can fit in between all of the tinier particles of clay. Well, this is really exciting. We're almost finished. We've got a beautifully shaped bed here that we're never going to have to go through that process again like that. At this point, we're done with our strings, so we can go ahead and get them out of the way. And uh, so that we won't uh, be tripping on them or anything, or stumbling. We'll just uh, put them aside. And we're ready at this point to apply our amendments. Now you want to refer to your manual for details and everything concerning the mixing and application of your amendments. You will have weighed them out and mixed and blended them before you get out here to the garden. I like to actually do my mixing in a Ziploc bag. After I've gotten my amendments in the bag, I'll actually make sure I've got some extra air in the bag, zip it shut, and then you can just thoroughly mix and homogenize those amendments back and forth like that. That's very important because sometimes you're going to have just a fraction of an ounce of a trace element like copper or zinc or molybd molybdenum. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say that one. Uh, and you need the larger amounts of calcium and other things that you're going to be put on, putting on to give enough volume of material to distribute over the bed evenly. But you want that tiny amount of material to be evenly spread throughout that entire mix. So you want to thoroughly, thoroughly mix and homogenate. Okay? Now, because some of the chemicals involved in these amendments uh, can be a little bit irritating to the skin, I like to wear a pair of latex surgical gloves. Actually, I only need one because I'm only going to be handling it with one hand. Some people want to use one of those little hand crank spreaders or something like that, but I have found and other gardeners have found that when you're trying to put on your amendments in a very precision way as we're doing here, there's nothing that beats the machinery of the human hand. It's very, very important We've weighed out these amendments to the precise amount that we need for this particular square footage of this bed, okay? And we need the same amount of amendments everywhere because we don't want to develop a richer soil on this end of the bed and a more deficient soil on the other end of the bed. So the goal here, as we grab a handful of amendments, we hold them with our hand uh, loosely clenched like this, and then with a rapid flicking of the wrist back and forth, you see the powder fine amendments just come out very evenly across the surface of the bed. Now what you want to do is you want to deliberately go too fine to begin with. In other words, you don't want to put too much on at first. Uh, go thin. Go thin on the first go around. From one side, you can, one side of the bed, you can do one end and you come around to the other side and you continue to spread all the way around. Okay. Then after you've gotten a good supply fairly evenly all over the bed and you've still got some left in your bag, then you're going to come back again and fill in the thin spots until you've got a good even amount everywhere. It's important that you go too thin at first because if you get too overconfident and try to get it all on on the first go, what will happen is you'll get almost all of it on two thirds of the bed or a half of the bed and you've run out and you don't have anything more to put on the rest of the bed. And guess what? 
You can always put more on, but once it's down, you can't get it up. <laughs> okay, so guess what? I'm talking from experience. <laughs> experience really is a good teacher, but there's a better teacher. It's wisdom. Learn from the wisdom and mistakes of others, and you can get out there and do a much better job more quickly than I could have if I didn't know what I was doing in the very beginning. Okay, we've got a few more thin spots here on the side. We're going to fill in. We've just got a little bit more in our bag. We're going to look for the thinnest areas to get it so that we're developing the same kind of soil, the same level of nutrients and fertility everywhere because we don't want to be a respecter of plants and overfeed our plants on this side and underfeed them on this side. Almost through here. That's it. And if you come up, come up and take a real close look on that bed, you'll see that instead of being that nice dark color now, you've got this kind of an ash gray. That's the mixture of all the different rock dusts and chemical amendments that are in here. And it's pretty evenly spread all over the bed. And you see that only took just a couple of minutes to do. It's not a difficult process at all. And I almost guarantee you that you could not do such an even job uh, with one of those uh, crank applicators or a drop spreader. A drop spreader doesn't work on a bed like this at all, okay? Use that on your lawn and other places. There are places to use those tools, but here your hands are really, really the best, guaranteed, okay? Now, if you have followed the instructions as far as the soil, taking your soil sample as we described before and in your manual, and you took your so soil sample from a depth of 12 inches, then the goal is now that you're going to mix these amendments in a full 12 inches because we're going to be building and balancing the soil 12 inches deep. In order to do that, our tines are 12 inches, so we just sink our fork into this lovely, loose, fluffy soil. I mean, this is just so easy. It's a delight. <laughs> it's so good. Feels so good. All the way across, we're going to mix them in. And after I have finished mixing all the way across, then I'm going to come back with my rake and do a final shaping of the bed. When we get to that point, I want to invite you to come back and we'll show you what the next step is. Okay, I've got my trusty board here because we're going to use that in the next skill, which is very important. But before we move on to that skill, I just want to mention something. Many people sometimes wonder why go through the process of raking twice after we had finished uh, digging the bed. Why rake before we put on the amendments and then mess it up again and have to come back and rake again? Well, the answer is really very simple. Because if you remember, after we'd finished digging and moving the soil around with our spade, there was a really rugged surface there with hills and valleys and all kinds of things like that. And with that kind of a surface, when we're trying to spread our amendments very evenly across the whole bed, what would happen is, is that the amendments would all fall off of the high spots into the low spots and you would not get an even uh, spread of amendments across the whole bed. But by just taking a few, couple of minutes and raking the bed roughly smooth, then spreading them as we did, we got a good, even spread and mix of our amendments, which is really, really very important. And then it only took a couple of more minutes just to rough shape it again. Now, in the process of our dig, we have actually mixed in so much air that uh, there's too much. It's actually going to collapse. The soil will collapse again as we put water on it, as it rains, and so on. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our same digging board, and it now becomes a tamping board. And we're going to lay it across our bed, and we're going to just walk across it, and it distributes our body weight evenly. It doesn't compact the bed completely again down to ground level, but it takes the excess air out so that when we water, it's not going to collapse unevenly, because that's what will happen. If you don't do this, uh, the collapsing from the water will create uh, holes and 
and uh, unevenness. The other thing that happens when you do this, as you notice here, the part that we've done already, um, it just creates a beautiful, smooth planting surface. You notice something that I have to do. I start off with my board on this edge. I'm walking across, and because of the loft of the bed, it doesn't reach all the way quite to the end, and I have to pull it down a little. And when you have a bed that raises up even more than this, you'll have to make that even more of an, of an adjustment. Okay, this is the last one. I've got to pull it down, do this last little portion, and I'll come bring it down to the end and do my end like so. And, and I'm done. Gardening is great. When you get to this point, you can even sit down on the job. This is probably the most enjoyable part of the whole process. Second only possibly to my favorite part of all, that's eating the finished product. <laughs> I'm sure everybody likes that the best. That's the wonderful thing about this, you know, it's, it's, this is not just exercise for exercise sake, like when you go to the gym or put on your jogging shoes. I mean, this is exercise with a purpose. And um, as I said, this, this is a permanent bed now. And uh, we're never going to have to go through that process again if you follow all the rest of the system that's detailed out in your manual. You should never have to do that again. The most you'll ever have to do probably for another six years is uh, once a year in the beginning of the spring to get your fork and come and just lightly fluff the surface. And of course you may need to incorporate some more amendments and you saw how easy that is because this ground is just so light, loose and fluffy now. Okay, well, even though we started some of our own seedlings, they weren't ready yet. So we just went out and purchased some of the regular ones in the, in the cell packs, which is fine to get started. In fact, if you're a really, really beginning gardener, I really recommend that you do just go ahead and purchase to begin with until you get your skills up to par and you know how to start your own without a lot of loss. You'll get even better results then. And it's a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper to start your own. The basic tools that we need are going to be a trowel. In this case, uh, because the root ball is going to be fairly large, I'm going to use a full-size trowel. But in many cases, uh, especially when you're transplanting out of flats, uh, you might have seedlings that are small enough that you want a, a smaller, narrower transplanting trowel like this that are available in different styles in different places. Today we won't use that, so we'll just set that aside. The other thing that we'll need is uh, a spacing stick. You'll notice here that I have, uh, th what, one, two, three, four laid out. This is three inches. This is. Uh, I think four inches here, nine inches, and twelve inches. There are other spacing distances. Refer to the back of your manual. There's a chart there that tells you exactly what the spacing distances are that are optimum for intensive planting on the hexagonal spacing that's explained in your manual. This, if you're used to conventional row planting, you're not going to want to use the spacings that you're accustomed to. They're going to be different, okay? So do check your manual. In this case, we're planting leaf lettuce. If we were going to plant these uh, to fully mature and produce heads, we would plant them about six inches apart. But there's another thing that you can do with leaf lettuce, and that is you can plant it as close as three inches apart, very, very close, and then you harvest it on a cut and come again basis. And again, that is explained in more detail in your manual. In this case, this is a romaine lettuce. It does okay on cut and come again, but it makes really nice heads too. So we'll go ahead and transplant this out on a six inch spacing. Okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna start in on one corner and you're going to find your halfway point on your measuring stick. 
and you're going to come halfway in from the end of the bed and halfway in from the side of the bed and make your mark. That's where the first plant is going to be. Now why are we making it only three inches in half of the distance instead of the full six? The reason is, is that those spacings are based so that when those plants are mature, the leaves are going to just barely touch, okay? So if you were to transplant your first one the full distance in, you're not going to fill out your bed completely. At least that's the theory. <laughs> but you'll find that as your soil gets better and better and better, um, that these plants get so big and grow so luxuriantly and profusely that uh, they can even almost spill over into the pathway area if you only have a two-foot path gets to the point where uh, you can hardly see the path sometimes with some crops and that's not going to happen with lettuce okay but it will happen with some other crops okay now I'm going to share with you a very very um, beautiful skill that I learned from another master gardener of how to do this transplanting with a trowel very very quickly and efficiently. Instead of holding the trowel in the regular way like you would like this, you're going to hold it more like a dagger, okay? And there's just a few simple motions involved in this process, okay, without any wasted motion so that you can get on with the job. Because, you know, when you do things more efficiently, not only don't you waste time, you don't waste time, but it's actually more fun and you can get on to the other activities that you have to do in your life. Because even though it's a lot of fun out here, let's face it, you don't want to be doing nothing but gardening all day long every day. Okay, so you're going to thrust the spade straight down, then push back, pull straight forward, and that has opened up your hole now. Now you're going to drop your seedling in to about the point where it was before, especially with lettuce. You want to make sure that the crown inside here is not covered up with soil or you don't get any soil dropping down inside here because it will rot okay there are certain other things like tomatoes and squash vines and things like that that you'll actually bury a large part of the stem all the way up to the first two leaves okay but in this case with lettuce we're only going to bury it to the same point of where it was before okay put it in now you're going to lift the trowel out and without putting it down, you're just going to take your thumb and forefinger and the end of the trowel and make one gentle thrust forward to close the hole up and establish root soil contact. Then you're going to stick out a couple of fingers here and come around on one side and around on the other side. And that forms a nice little uh, round crater there so that you can come and put water on just as soon as possible. That's really very, very important to avoid transplant shock. You want to make sure that your seedlings have been thoroughly uh, watered beforehand. You want to make sure that your bed is thoroughly moist. And this time of year where it's cool, um, it's not so critical, but especially when you get into the warmer part of the year, you want to make sure you get water on them very quickly. Also, for the best transplanting time, refer to your manual. Okay? Now, here's where I'm going to use the spacing stick, we measure across the width of the bed, our six inches, make a mark, get the next one, straight down, back, pull forward to open up the hole, drop the seedling in, thrust straight forward, make my hole all the way around, and you're done. Okay, the next one is going to go here, down, back, forward, in, thrust, hole. See how fast this goes? Okay, measure my next one across, down, back, forward, drop it in, thrust, make my little circle. Now, I'm not going to finish out that row yet because I want to show you what happens on the next two rows here. I'm going to pull my board back just a little bit to make a little bit more room. By the way, why am I sitting on this board? Well, obviously, because I don't want to compact that bed again. The board, again, is distributing my weight evenly so I can sit comfortably and work in here without uh, creating any compaction. Okay, now on the second row, I'm going to be measuring from both 
the first and from the second plants, from here and from here, creating an equilateral triangle. And there's my mark, that's where that plant is going to go. And you'll find that however many plants fit in the first row, there's going to be at, there's going to be usually one less on the second row. They, they won't be actually equal, okay? So down, back, forward, drop it in, thrust it, make my little hole. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do the next one. Now I can measure from this plant that I just put in and from this other one in the first row, and that's where the plant is going to go. Down, back, pull straight forward, open up my hole, drop it in, making sure that I don't go too deep because this is lettuce and I don't want the soil to get in and rot the crown. Okay, now, again, I'm not going to finish out that row because I want you to see what happens on the third row. We develop a little problem here. It's not a problem if you know what to do. Because the second row started in a little bit more staggered than the first one, my next plant is going to be in line with this one. It's going to be somewhere over here. But guess what? I've only got one plant to measure from, so I don't know exactly where to put it. So I skip that one. I don't do it first. I come in and plant this, what's going to be the second plant in a row because I've got two lettuces here to measure from. So I go from here and from here, and I know that that's where that lettuce plant is going to go. And I put it in, down, back, forward, drop it in, gentle thrust, make my circle. And now I've got these two plants here that I can measure from. What did I do with my stick? <laughs> Rolled away from me. Okay. Now I can measure from this plant and from this one, and I know exactly where to put it. Down, back, forward, drop it in thrust, circle, and that is essentially it. You'll continue to plant on out as much as you need of that particular crop. Now you don't have to fill your whole bed with one crop. Maybe you'll only have one or two feet of this variety of lettuce. Then maybe you want a red lettuce. And then maybe you want another crop entirely. I want to just plant a few of these red cabbages here, not only for the beautiful color contrast, but also to show you what I was talking about as far as burying them and planting them a little bit differently than we do the lettuce. As I said, we're going to space it out a full 12 inches away so that as these lettuce and cabbage grow up, they won't crowd each other out too badly. Then we start halfway in from the edge. So my first plant is going to go right here, down, back, pull straight forward, and this time I'm going to drop it all the way into the first two set of leaves, okay, like that. Let's do just one or two more. This time it's going to be 12 inches apart. Here's where my second one goes. And in this case, I've actually got a couple of leaves that are pretty anemic. They're dying. They're dead. So I'm going to pull them off. I'm actually going to pull those other, these off too. And all of this stem that's buried, this will all develop roots. Okay? And the new stem that comes up there will be much stronger than the little spindly part that's down here at the bottom. Okay? Down, back, pull straight forward, drop it all the way in to those first two sets of leaves there now, thrust it, make my little hole, and there we've got it. Okay? So that's basically the process right there. I also want to now mention to you why it is that when we were edging and digging, we made sure to cut out at an angle into the pathway. Well, by now, some of you smart ones have already figured it out. It's really quite simple. The reason is, is that the plants that are here towards the center of the bed have nice, loose soil all the way around 360 degrees, and they will grow to their full potential. But with these plants, 
that are very, very close to the edge. If we had edge straight down, what's going to happen is on this side, the roots have lots of loose soil that they can roam as far as they want. But when they get here, they're going to suddenly hit compacted earth and the roots of plants are not drill bits. They will take the easiest or the path of least resistance, okay? And you will literally see that uh, the plants on the side will be stunted and not as large and productive in growth. So this affects your overall yield in the end. Okay, so that's the reason. By edging that out into the pathway, you've got nice loose soil even out here for about three to six inches out here into the pathway down underneath those roots can be growing out and taking advantage of nice loose soil under here as well. Okay, in just a minute I'm going to go and get my watering wand and show you how easy it is to water these beds. There are automatic types of watering systems that you can use with these beds if you are gardening on a huge commercial scale. But for the average backyard gardener, nothing can beat hand watering with a wa watering wand. And the reason for that is very, very simple. We go into it in the manual and you can read that in more detail. But with your human eye, you can apply the water exactly where it's needed. Sometimes you'll have one side of the bed that has had a southern exposure and has dried out more. You can apply more water there. And where it doesn't need water, you can put less. This can add up to a lower water bill if you have to pay for your water, even if you pump it out of a well, it's electricity, whatever. So you're, you're conserving uh, natural resources. And if you hadn't heard recently, water is a, getting to be, pure water is getting to be a scarcer and scarcer commodity in the earth today. So uh, you want to practice conservation. The other thing is, is that as you get out here uh, at least once a day, your garden becomes a beautiful place. You'll want to be there. You don't have the problem with weeds and everything and this, this color and the, and the beauty of nature all around. You'll want to be there. It's a wonderful place to pray, to meditate, uh, but you'll want to be paying attention to your little babies and making sure that they're okay, seeing through all of their needs, not only water, but noticing when they're ready to harvest, noticing whether there might be some kind of pest problem developing. Uh, in the process of building your soil, sometimes you still might have an occasional problem. And if you get in there and uh, bring about corrective measures early on, uh, you'll have much better results. So the watering time is my favorite time uh, to be out there, to observe the garden, and also to meditate, to unwind after a stressful day of work, or just to pray and to spend time with God in nature. Okay? A watering wand is wonderful because you can, from standing in one position, easily reach all areas of your bed, even a much longer bed. You won't have to move about very much. Okay? You want to direct an even spray, not too fast, but the secret is to keep the wand moving. Don't let it uh, stay in one spot too long because it will begin to pool and puddle and run off faster than it can go in. Okay, the principle with watering is ideal. I mean, not ideal. <laughs> the principle is the same as with spreading the amendments. You want even moisture. You want the same amount of moisture everywhere, just like we wanted the same amount of nutrition everywhere okay because this this soil was already so well moistened prior to our digging process i really couldn't put on very much without it already beginning to run off you can see a spot here where it started to begin to run there was another one on the other side where it began to run that's why i cut it off immediately uh, if this was drier it would take much more water before it would begin to run off. Also, as you begin to build up your organic matter and your structure, you'll find that you'll have open pores and the water will go into the soil much more rapidly and easily without any running at all. Now, if you happen to have a type of a soil that uh, the water won't penetrate, it's kind of stubborn and it won't go in even after you've double dug with the slope on the sides, a very easy solution is, is that you spread an organic mulch like straw, 
alfalfa hay or something else like that and the mulch will help to hold the water from running off the sides and will help it to soak in. That's a solution that I found in some cases. Again, refer back to your manual for the details on the watering. Just mention that you know when to stop even before the water runs off by the sheen that develops on the surface. Let me just put a little water on this spot so you see what I mean. Okay, you see how the water is starting to sit on the surface there and it's not going straight in, develops that sheen. When you begin to see that, you know you've got saturation. Okay, there's a lot more uh, subtleties and fine details that I won't go into now. They're in your manual. Refer back to those points because they are very, very important if you want to get the very, very best results in your garden.